My name's Shannon. Welcome to Mosaic. Glad to have you guys out this morning. Hope that all of you come out for the dunk tank because I'm obviously going to say something that's offensive or at the very least convicting this morning. And you know, if you don't like that, you can give me back. So. All right, so most of you probably know the theme of The Lord of the Rings. Maybe you've read the book, more likely you've seen the movie. Um, but this theme at the beginning, that they were all of them deceived. All right? They were all of them deceived. It's one of the major underlying themes of the movie, how easily all of us are deceived. So at the beginning of the movie, we get this orientation. We get caught up on the plot that's going on in the movie. We've got the evil lord Sauron. He has 19 rings. <coughs> He gives three of them to the elves. He gives seven of them to the dwarf boys. He gives nine of them to the kings of men. And all these guys think, man, we got something really cool here. These rings of power, they're going to help us. We're going to be able to you know, rule over other people. We're going to have some power here. But it says they were all of them deceived. Because there was another ring. There was a master ring. Was, the lord of the ring is Isara. Is He's got this master ring. And this ring was something that he could use to control other people and to corrupt those who were wearing the other rings. All right, do you guys know the, the mantra, the little, the little poem about the ring? Who knows what I'm talking about? Who, oh, come on. You're, look, some of you, you're not willing to raise your hand, but you know it. I don't think you, okay, you got it, all right? Yeah, who else has it? Come on, this is, this is easy audience participation. We'll talk about sin later. This is, this is whether you know the Lord of the Rings, come on. All right, one ring to rule them all. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all and in the darkness bind them. See, it rhymes. And I think it rhymes in Elven as well. <laughs> or whatever, you know, whatever the dark language is that is written. So all of them, they received a gift, but all of them, but they were all of them deceived. All right? So again, one of the underlying themes is how easily we are deceived. How easily we can be tempted to believe a convenient lie. That there are lies that we believe that, that we're really comfortable with believing. We look at our lives and we say, you know what? All is well. There is no cause for alarm. Everything is going the way that it needs to be going. But that isn't God's view of the world. All right? Most of the time, though, we are happy to believe a lie. Because believing a lie can keep our life convenient. It can keep our life simple. I don't have to deal with an inconvenient truth if I just allow myself to believe a lie. Most of us go through life that way. It is a convenient, it's an easier way to go through life than confront, confronting the brutal facts. And part of the reason that we tend to believe lies is because just like in the fictional story that Tolkien's putting together, we have an enemy who desires for us to believe lies. All right, but this morning we want to go to war with some lies. We're continuing our series called Good Soil. And we're going to continue to talk about what it looks like for us to cultivate hearts that bear fruit. But as we do that, we want to talk about deception and about our tendency to be very easily deceived. Then we'll talk about God's solution to our deception, which is simple obedience. Before we dig into all of that, I just want to take a minute to get our minds back in the flow of the series. Many of you were here last week, some of you weren't. If you're new to Mosaic, welcome. We'll catch you up just a little bit from last week. If you were here, this is recap. You need this. You really weren't paying attention last week anyway. I saw there might have been a couple of you even nodding off. So this is a chance for redemption to get back into it. So last week we were looking at the parable of sowing. And God is presented as this recklessly generous farmer. Kind of a dumb farmer. If you're, if you're saying, man, where can I strategically put my seed to grow the most seed, to grow the most plants? He didn't do that. We see this generous farmer who, who looks at all sorts of soil and he says, you know what, my seed is good. I think my seed could grow anywhere. So he's scattering it around. He's scattering it on the sidewalk. He's scattering it in the gravel. He sees a patch of dandelions. He's like, I'm going to put some of my seed there. I think my plant could even grow there. And once in a while, we see him come to a patch of really good soil. It is dark. It is rich. It is fertile. It's got nutrients going in it. And he scatters a little bit of seed in there. But in every place that he goes, he is scattering seed that he's hoping will do what seed was meant to do. He's hoping that that seed will sprout, that that seed will sink down deep into the soil, that its roots, that its tendrils, that they'll spread out, that they'll draw in nutrients, and that it will, it will allow the seed to grow. We'll take the seed and we're going to develop the seed into a plant. And the hope of 
planting that seed, of seeing it grow into a plant, is that it would produce more seed, that it would reproduce. All right, and then he goes on to explain to us what is all of this about. In the story, we see that God is the farmer, and the seed is the gospel. The seed is the good news. The seed is this message that God created us for a relationship with him, and not just any relationship. Throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, the relationship that God is creating us for is that we would be his bride. Not individually, but corporately. That the people of God would be his bride. So we are the ones that he absolutely loves. You know, that he lies awake at night thinking about, that he dreams about, that he, you know, that he writes love notes to. That's what the Bible is supposed to be. All right, we are the people whom God is crazy about. But the Bible also presents the picture that we're not just the would-be bride, but we are the unfaithful would-be bride. We are the bride who has been sleeping around. We are the bride who is, who is coming and saying, God, I love you, I want to be with you, let me sing songs of worship to you. But I've got another God on the side. All right? I've, I've got other counterfeit gods, I've got so many other things that I wrap my heart around, that I pursue, that I love more than God. All right? For some of you, it's, it's academic success. For some of you, it's career. For some of you, it's family. We look at family and say, what could be better than family? What could be better than me loving my children, loving my wife, devoting myself to my family? God says, well, I can think of at least one thing that's better than that. I'm better than that. The God of the universe is better than that. It's not to say that God doesn't want you to pursue academic excellence or to pursue your career or to love your family. Oh, he says, I don't want you to worship those things. I want you to worship me. But the Bible presents us as the would-be bride of Christ. The bride of God who has been unfaithful, who has rebelled against him, who has gone chasing after other gods. So that's kind of the bad news in the midst of the good news. But the good news is that despite our unfaithfulness, God said, I want you. I am coming after you. I'm going to chase you down. You've been unfaithful. I know you've been unfaithful. I don't care. I am going to the brothel, and I'm going to pick you up, and I'm going to take you home. Because I want to be with you. Because I love you. That's the gospel message. And that Jesus Christ, God sent his son, he became a man, he lived a perfect life, he lived the life we were supposed to live. He died the death we deserved to die in order that we could be reconciled to him through faith in Jesus Christ. The gospel message is I don't have to do better, I don't have to try harder, I don't have to clean up my life first so that I can come back to God. But rather I'm broken, I'm sinful, I, I really messed this thing up. But I have a God who loves me, who wants me, who has chased after me, and who will continue to chase after me. That is the seed in the parable of sowing. That is the message that Jesus was preaching. That's the message that the apostles were preaching. And that is the message that we have been called to preach. That's the message that God was scattering everywhere. He looked at people and he didn't say, man, you look like you would be very disinterested in this. You have like five degrees from the University of Michigan. I, I don't think you need Jesus. Or, wow, you have a messed up life. I see why you're standing on that street corner. I don't think you're interested in Jesus. He didn't do any of that. He said, you know what? I have some really good seed. I'm going to scatter it everywhere. I'm going to give it out to everyone. He's called us to the change. And his hope in doing that is that that seed, that gospel message, that we would see it, that we would dwell on it, that we would meditate on it, that we would grasp it, that it would grasp us, that it would sink into the soil of our heart and that it would transform our hearts. That it would take our hearts that are otherwise hard, our hearts that are otherwise resistant, our hearts that are distracted, and that it would draw us to Him in such a way that we would not only be drawn to Him, but we would be drawn to the people around us. We would be drawn to share that same message with others. We would be compelled. All right? That's the idea of the parable of the sower. That we would reproduce that, we, that our lives would be such good soil, such fertile soil for the gospel, that they would reproduce more seed. He says 30, 60, even 100 times what was sown, that we would reproduce. We call it discipleship. It begins with evangelism. It begins with sharing our faith. But too often in the church, we tend to think that discipleship, evangelism, all of that work of ministry is something that should be reserved for the super-Christians. It, it's not something that is normative for the Christian life. But what Jesus said, what we learned last week, is that you are not the exception to the rule. Jesus said that if we are truly Christians, fruitfulness should be the norm. 
Not just fruitfulness in character, not just becoming a better person, not just becoming more loving and patient, but reproducing. Because that's what a seed was made to do. To recap just a little bit more, I just want to read through the tail end of what we looked at last week. Jesus' explanation of the parable of the sower. He says, the farmer sows the word. His message is the seed. His, the gospel message is the seed. The word of God is the seed. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. It's as though the message was never preached. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, they hear the word, and at once they receive it with joy. They, altar call, come on down. This sounds great. At once they receive it with joy, but they have no root. Since the response to the message is shallow and superficial, since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others see, still others, like seeds sown among the thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and they choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, even 100 times what was sown. Jesus said if we are truly Christians, and if we are actually allowing the gospel to sink into our hearts, and begin this transformational work inside of us, that the normative thing, the normal thing, the ordinary thing, would be that that seed would germinate and that it would produce fruit. That our lives would be reproducing. And if our lives aren't fruitful, if, are not, if our lives aren't reproducing, then biblically the solution is not to get really guilty and discouraged and say, man, what can I do to be more fruitful? How can I, how can I manufacture some, some fruit? How can I put some more effort into this thing that I might bear fruit? Does the Christian life require effort? Yes. But a fruit tree is not like a factory. In a factory, if you want to produce more, it is a mechanical process. So all we really need to do is sign up some guys for overtime, and we can increase our production. Doing better and trying harder will not increase your fruitfulness in the Christian life because we're not talking about mechanical growth. We're talking about organic growth. We're talking about growth that flows out of who we are. Reproduction that flows out of who we are. So if we look at our lives and say, my life is unfruitful, in terms of reproducing disciples for the kingdom, in terms of sharing the gospel and seeing it penetrate other hearts, if my life is unfruitful, then what needs to change is the conditions of the soil. So when I hear about these different kinds of soil, when I hear about the path and the rocky soil and the weedy soil, in the good soil, and the Holy Spirit is working in me, it would be natural that I would feel conviction and I would say, man, what is wrong with the soil of my heart that it's not reproducing? Is the soil of my heart hard from being stubbornly resistant to God? Like some of what we looked at last week, have I continually said no to the conviction of the Holy Spirit in such a way that I don't hear His voice anymore? Do I need to do something to soften my heart? Is my heart rocky? Is my, is my response shallow? Do I tend to just not think very hard about what God is calling me to? Is my heart full of weeds? Do I love so many other things more than I love Jesus that distract me from pursuing Him and keep me from being fruitful? Or is my heart good soil? And how can I make my heart? What can I change in my heart? What can I let go of in my heart that my heart would be a better place for the gospel to take root, for the soil for the seed to seek deep into the soil of my heart. Those are the questions that we're exploring in the series. So this week, we'll continue to talk about what it means to be good soil, but we're going to turn our attention to the book of James. And the book of James, it's all about faith and works. It's all about faith and action. Not just believing that God is the creator and sustainer of the universe and the Lord of the universe, but actually living as though that is true. Putting those two things in tension, and working out that tension. So we're going to get to the heart of the book, really the core of what James is saying. The verses we'll look at are James chapter 1, verses 21 through 25. And in it, we're going to see the same metaphor about a seed that's been planted in the heart. But we're going to learn about a deception that all of us far too often believe. And we're going to see an opportunity to move past that deception in order that our hearts might become good and fruitful soil for the gospel to grow and bear fruit. 
All right, so let's dive in. James 1, 21. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. So he's hitting on the same metaphor, the same imagery that, that Jesus used in Mark chapter 4, the idea of a seed planted in you, which can save you. And in this particular passage, scholars debate, what kind of salvation is he talking about? All right, is this like saved from, from sin and death and judgment and hell? Or is this like saved from being stupid? Because if you go to the Proverbs, there's a lot of Proverbs that are about being saved from being stupid. You know, you can save your life if you, if you just don't make so many stupid decisions. My favorite proverb growing up, some of you won't like it, but it's the very word of God. Um, Proverbs 11, 22. It's not in the slides, so don't even look for it. Like a gold, anybody know this one? Oh, it's a good one. You need to memorize it. Jessica knows it. Uh, like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. It's a proverb written to young men. It says, you know what, young man? You are going to see a beautiful woman, and, and you're going to forget everything else. You're going to forget your name. You're going to forget how to speak. You're going to stutter. Beautiful woman is a good thing. But a beautiful woman who shows no discretion, who has no wisdom, who doesn't know how to conduct herself, who doesn't know how to pursue God well, well, that's like a really good thing in a really bad setting, really bad circumstance. It's like a gold ring in a pig's town. Okay, beautiful. Then there's potential here. But this is not the woman that you want to run off and marry until we work out this discretion thing, until we work out this character thing, until she learns to love and pursue God. All right, so the Bible has a lot of these pithy sayings, these proverbs that are just, you know what, if you show some wisdom, young man, you can save yourself from a lot of grief. So some people, they look at this and they say, you know, James is kind of the proverbs of the New Testament. I think that's what's going on. And there's a good case for that. The verses before are basically saying things like, don't talk so much. Um, think before you speak. Novel. All right? Listen before you speak. My wife thinks I could still work from that. Probably could. All right, don't, don't go along throwing temper tantrums and getting mad all the time like a two-year-old. That's the sort of advice that we see leading up to this. So there's a good case to say, maybe James is saying, you know, get some godly wisdom in your life and you'll save yourself from a lot of grief. There's also a case to be saying that he's saying exactly what Jesus was saying in the passage we looked at last week. Let the gospel sink in. Let the word of God sink in to eternally save you, save you from sin and death and judgment and hell. But regardless of which kind of salvation we're talking about, the response of our heart needs to be the same. We need to repent. We need to turn from our sin. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent. We read that and we think, oh, the evil out there, the bad people out there, the terrible people. I'm not going to be like them. Well, maybe that's part of it. Or maybe it's get rid of the moral filth in your own heart. Let go of the things that you love that God hates. Humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. We need to humble our hearts. We need to believe the message. We need to agree with God about our need and respond in obedience, which is a lot of the point that James is making throughout his book. All right, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. This is the core of the book of James. This is the one verse that he wants you to get. He wrote 105 verses over five chapters. This is the one that he wants you to memorize, that he wants you to reflect on. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. All right, it's Sunday morning. We have come to worship. We have sung to Jesus. We have sung to God the Father. We have sung to the Holy Spirit. And we have done so with sincere hearts and the best of intentions. If you're not quite there yet, that's okay. Welcome to Mosaic, Mosaic Church. But I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. We've come to sincerely worship God with our lips. We're sitting here now. Everyone but me sitting. We're all listening to God's Word. We're wrestling with God's Word. And I believe that most of us are doing that very sincerely, saying, how can I be changed by God's Word? How can I hear God's Word and respond to God's Word? We do it with the best of intentions. But he's saying, you know what, if your intentions do not become reality, if you simply listen to the word, if you simply hear the word, but you do not respond to the word, if it doesn't change your action, then you're deceived. Then you're just like the characters in Tolkien's story. But they were all of them deceived. 
We really think that we're moving in a great direction, but we are not. So how are we deceived? What is the lie that we believe? All right, I think we could spend the next 72 hours listing off thousands of lies we believe, but I want to zoom in on three of them. Lie number one. I'm listening now, but I will obey later. I'm listening now, but I will obey later. I will be sexually pure later, after I'm married. It's a lie we tend to believe. I will give sacrificially to advance the kingdom of God later. You know, after I pass my death. I will personally just, just chase after God. I'll take time to read my Bible. I'll take time to pray, to pray. I will pursue God with all of my heart later. But this is a busy season of life. It doesn't fit into my life now. I'm in school now. I'm in residency now. When I get my new job in a couple of months, I'm going to have margin. And then I will pursue God. I will do this later. I hear the word now. I understand the word now. I will obey later. James calls that deception. We are self-deceived. And we do this absolutely every day. If you listen now, but you do not obey now, you are deceived. If I listen now, but I do not obey now, I am deceived. I'm living in a fantasy world. I'm not letting the word of God penetrate my heart. I'm not letting the gospel penetrate my heart. Delayed obedience is disobedience. But more than that, according to the passage we looked at last week, when I hear the word of God, when God reveals himself to me, and I choose in my heart, I am not going to respond to God. He says that there is a hardening of my heart. It's not a neutral thing where I came to church and at least I listened. At least I, at least I entertained the idea. I just didn't act on it yet. I'll do that later. It's not neutral. He says it's worse than neutral. He says if we are coming and we are listening without intending to obey, that we're doing damage to our soul. That we are hardening our hearts. That it is becoming harder for us to be receptive to what he wants to reveal to us. Line number two. I pray the prayer of salvation so I am right with God. I believe the gospel so now I am a Christian. Maybe. I hope so. I will say this. The only way that I can become a Christian is through believing the gospel. I can't get in through a side door, through my relationships, through my parents, through my grandparents, through my human effort. It's only through the gospel that I can become a Christian. But if all that has changed in my life is that I have professed faith, and my obedience hasn't changed at all, then James would say, you know what, I'm not so sure that you're a Christian. In fact, I think that you're self-deceived. People read through the book of James, and they often get frustrated, particularly if they understand the gospel well. If you were a moralist, and you read through the book of James, and he's, he's talking about changing your behavior and, and living in obedience, then you'd be like, man, this is what they taught me in the Boy Scouts. This is what I was taught at home. This, this is what I've got all along. Yes, I can do better. I can try harder. I can get this together. But if you really understand the gospel and you read the book of James, it's like there's a lot of direction and talk about action. And you seem to have kind of a low view of faith, James. What's going on there? James, do you disagree with Paul? Because Paul said that I'm saved by grace alone, through faith alone. You, you seem to trash talk faith a little bit. Paul said, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. That's what Paul teaches. But James, he continues to insist, if you are not obedient to Jesus, then I think you're going to hell. Why does he say that? Why does he teach that? I think James simply reminds us that faith without obedience isn't faith. It reminds us that faith without obedience isn't faith. James says explicitly, James 2.14, another key verse in this book. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? What's James' answer? No. It doesn't work that way. Let me be louder. Not convicting enough? Is this better? We won't get that one on tape. Can such a faith save him? If the man has works but has no deeds, can such a faith save him? James' his answer is no. He totally agrees with Paul that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. That is how we're saved. But he says a lack of obedience proves a lack of faith. 
If your faith isn't changing your life, it's something, but it's not faith. He goes on later, he says, even the demons believe there's one God. You believe there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. But that is something different than saving faith. And if we don't get that, then we are being deceived. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German guy, first half of the last century, he puts it very simply in his classic book, Positive Discipleship. He says, only he who believes is obedient, and only he who is obedient believes. He says, all of the rest of us are simply deceived. Now, does that mean that those of us who are genuine Christians were sinlessly perfect? Everyone else can feel guilty, but, you know, God together, sinlessly perfect, never sin at all. It doesn't mean that at all. If you interacted with me before the service, if you heard something come out of my mouth, a lot of you have, have heard or seen me sin this morning. All right, it, it's a pretty regular thing. It's a pretty constant thing. My pride, my words, my lust, my greed, this heart that I have that manufactures idols and that chases after all sorts of things. Like the old school hymn that says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That's my heart. But what is the deepest desire of my heart? On a good day, when I've had enough sleep, which doesn't seem to come often enough, and, and when the kids have said, you know what? I just feel like I can love my daddy well by giving him three minutes where, where neither me nor my sister asked if we can have another snack. <laughs> On a good day like that, the deepest desire of my heart that, is that I might know Jesus and that I might, might obey Jesus, that I might pursue Jesus. On those other days, the deepest desire of my heart may very well be peace and quiet. All right? That's something that, that I need to work on, something that needs to change. The question I have for you this morning is simple. Is that your desire? Do you desire to know God's will and to do it, whatever the cost may be? Is that what you want? Do you have a faith in Jesus Christ, a faith in God that would compel you to be obedient to God? Do you desire to serve? Do you desire to sacrifice? When you read about the hard soil and the rocky soil and the weedy soil and the good soil, do you desire to break up the hard soil? Do you, do you just start cataloging through your life and saying, where are the weeds? Because I see some fruit in my life, but I want to be more fruitful. Where are the weeds in my life? How can I go to war with my weeds? How can I grab a hold of them and pull them up by the roots that there might be more room in the soil for the seed of the gospel to grow in my heart? Is that your response to the word of God? Line number three. Calling Christians to radical discipleship is a legalistic addition to saving faith. Line number three, calling Christians to radical discipleship is a legalistic addition to saving faith. That is a lie from the pit of hell, and that is a lie that the American church believes in huge numbers. That calling Christians to radical discipleship is a legalistic addition to saving faith. That there is a super Christian bar that is optional, and there is a minimal Christian bar that gets me in the door, and I don't have to be bothered with the call of Jesus to discipleship. It's a lie. It is not what the Bible teaches. Somehow, we have so twisted and reshaped and ignored the teachings of Jesus and recreated them in our own American image that we've completely ignored his call to discipleship. Another Bonhoeffer quote, he said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. That's normal. Read through the Gospels. Jesus paraphrases that message, rather Bonhoeffer paraphrases Jesus, many times. I'll take you to one of them. Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Is it hate in a malicious way? No. It's hate in a prioritizing way. That we would love God so much more than we love any of those most wonderful things in my life. What is more wonderful than my beautiful little seven-year-old daughter, Chloe? Jesus is more wonderful than Chloe. 
If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. That's what Jesus said. Yet somehow we listen to that and we walk away trying to justify the idea that even though we live in the richest society in the history of the world, God certainly desires nothing more than a maximum of 10% of my money and 3 to 5% of my time. That's a lot. That's not the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus is that I am a king. I am your king and I love you. That I am a bridegroom and I want to be your bridegroom because I love you. But it is going to require a single-hearted devotion to me. It's going to require a passionate pursuit of me. Anything less than that is less than the call that's been given. God demands all that we have and all that we are. Regarding money, Haggai, Old Testament prophecy, God says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. By that, he doesn't mean some of the silver and some of the gold. He's talking about the $3 in my pocket and the $3 in your pocket. He looks at that $3 and he says, that's mine. Doesn't mean that it needs to go in the offering plate today. But he says, that's mine. We look at it and we say, no, God, it's mine. It's under the supervision of my priorities, of my needs and my wants. He says, no, no, it's not yours, it is mine. I put it in your hand because you're my servant. And I want you to steward it. Oh my glory. I've given you time. That is my time. That I want you to steward. For my glory. I've given you gifts and talents and influence and relationships. Skills and abilities, all sorts of things. Everything that I've given you, I've given you to steward for my glory. All of your stuff and you, you are mine. You go to the New Testament, one of the guys, he comes up to Jesus trying to trap him, trying to get him in a political argument, kind of separate the Republicans and Democrats of the day, get somebody mad at him. He asks him, should we pay taxes to Caesar? To Caesar? Jesus takes that question. He says, you know what, give me a coin. Let me see one of those coins. Whose picture and inscription are on this coin? Well, Caesar's. He says, all right, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. People read that and they say, oh, I guess you wanted them to pay taxes. Okay, I guess I should pay taxes. That's part of it. But whose image and whose inscription are on you? You were created in the image of God. The implicit message that he's saying there, give the coin with Caesar's picture on it to Caesar. Give the person with God's picture on it to God. Give yourself to God. God looks at you and he says, you are mine. I claim you. Not in a malicious way, but in a loving way. I claim you, I desire you, I want to redeem you. And now you have responsibility. You've been given the word of God. How will you respond to it? You have listened. All right? Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Live in light of this truth. Think of other challenging passages. Gentlemen, does anyone know Job 31.1? I won't make you quote it. Does anybody know it? Job 31.1. Got a couple of you. I memorized it in a couple of different translations because it was something I needed to think about. I get it mixed up a little bit. But he essentially says, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl. Young men, this is a man. This is a good passage to memorize. Go through the context. You can say, well, that's just Job saying that. He did that. I don't need to do that. Go through the passage. It's very clear. If you study it this afternoon, that that is some, a desire that God has for your life. Something that he has called you to in obedience. That you make a covenant with your eyes. Not to look lustfully at a girl. Do we listen to the word? Merely listen and so deceive ourselves? Or do we do what it says? passages that we've looked at in the last couple of weeks, Matthew 9, Mark 4, it's very clear that God has called us, any of us who have claimed the name of Jesus, that he's called us to make disciples, to engage in his mission with him. Do we merely listen to the word and so deceive ourselves, or do we do what it says? 
If you want to wrestle with these ideas more, I want to strongly encourage you to pick up a book called Radical. I read it a year or two ago. It's not a very old book. Subtitle is Taking Back Your Faith from the American Dream. I want to share just a few quick quotes from that, and then we'll move on. It says, We are settling for a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves when the central message of Christianity is actually about abandoning ourselves. We've got it upside down and backwards. He says, I cannot help but think that somewhere along the way, we had missed what was radical about our faith and replaced it with what was comfortable. Another quote of his, not from the book, he says, we don't have time to play games with our lives. We don't have time to play games in the church. We do not have time to waste our lives on, nice, on a nice, comfortable Christian spin of the American dream. Last one. My biggest fear, even now, is that I will hear Jesus' words and walk away, content to settle for less than radical obedience to him. In other words, my biggest fear is that we would be deceived. That I would be deceived. That I would hear Jesus' words and walk away content to settle for less than radical obedience to him. Have you come here this morning to listen to the word of God and to go home? Or have you come here this morning to wrestle with what it would look like to respond in radical obedience to the call of Jesus Christ? To do what his word says. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Verse 23. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. This was a passage that I read a lot as a kid. I think James is a popular book, like I said, trying to beat the stupid out of, out of young men. So I read it a lot, and I never had a clue what it meant. For seven or eight times I read it, I just did not get it. Then one day it clicked, and I understood what he was saying. Think about what you look like first thing in the morning. You are stumbling straight out of bed. You got the fat head, a little bit of drool. Uh, you know, that's, that's depressing. I've given you enough hard things. Don't think about what you like in the, look like in the morning. Think about what your roommate looks like in the morning. Think about what your wife or your husband looks like in the mor morning. Oh, come on! Come on, that's a better thought for you, Jess. No, that's not right. So, so Jess, she has what I call the rock star hair. It is awesome, but she hates it when I talk about that. So, we're done. <laughs> Think about what you look like in the morning, all right? Those of you who have hair, your hair looks crazy. Those of you who don't, this is like the one redeeming time of the day where that's like a benefit. <laughs> you, you, maybe you've been laying on your pillow and there's a crease in your pillow and you've got like a, a pink line down your face that matches that crease. Um, you know, there's, there's some drool, those of you who drool during the night that's coming down your chin. Okay, what do you do? You, you go to the bathroom, you look in the mirror, maybe you put on your glasses, you put in your contacts, maybe you have eagle eyes and it's just more depressing every morning, even, you know, you can't even splash some water on your face before you see what you look like. All right, but, but you brush your teeth because your biggest concern is, you know, your breath is awful and, you know, if you have kids, they're probably even going to tell you that if you're not careful. So, so you start brushing your teeth, you know, and, and you're going, you're, you're brushing. Um, you notice while you're brushing that that the drool that you had is replaced by Colgate drool. You know, it's just kind of going down your face. And you look ridiculous. You look even more ridiculous than you did when you walked into the bathroom. All right? But you leave that place and you walk out the door and you start your day. Looking ridiculous. All right? You have looked at the mirror. You realize what you look like. But then you, you glanced away from the mirror and you totally forgot what you looked like and so you went to work. Now, if you could keep that mirror in front of you, if you could remember what you looked like all day long, you would never go out in public like that, except for those of you who are supremely secure or who say, well, I find my identity in the gospel. It is not important what I look like. I, I, I don't care at all. I don't think we have one of those people. If you're that sanctified, let me know. We've got, we've got huge opportunities for you to disciple others here at Mosaic. All right? Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what he says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror. And after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So the scripture is something that brings conviction. It lets me, it lets me see the things in my life that are, that are out of line, that are ridiculous, that need to be changed. 
All right, that, for the last decade, that's been my understanding of this passage. And I think it's the right understanding, I think it's good. Um, lots of commentators and scholars agree with that. Um, it was really interesting this week, Justin and I were digging into this passage together, and um, he had a different take on it that I thought was also really insightful that I wanted to share with you guys. He was reading it, and maybe because I'm so stubborn, I come to the Word of God and I think, God, you need to convict me, you need to correct me, you need to hit me with a hammer, because otherwise it's going to be bad. Um, but other people, maybe who aren't like that, they come to the Word of God for encouragement. Um, you know, so he looked at me and says, you know what, when I look into the Word of God, what I see is, is, is not just what needs to change, but I see who God made me to be. I see what my identity really is. I come to the Word of God and, and I hear the Gospel preached to me and I see that I've been adopted as a child of God. That God loves me, that God is absolutely crazy about me. He didn't say it that way, that's a little bit girly for him. A little bit emotive. But, but this idea of the Gospel... All right? I see it, and I, I grasp my identity. I, I come to the Word of God, and I see that I've been adopted as a son, that I've been commissioned as a missionary, that I've been called to follow, that I'm a disciple, that I'm a disciple maker, that I've, called to be, I've been called to be the chaplain of my workplace, I've been called to be the pastor of my neighborhood, that I've been called to serve as a missionary on mission with God. I see the light that God desired for me, and I want to see it more. And there is a temptation... If I merely listen to the word and deceive myself and never do what it says, that I never step into that identity that God has given me. That I miss out on the life that God made me for. And I think part of what James is saying is, I don't want you to miss out on that. He says, for those of you who have placed your faith in Jesus, the Bible shows us who we really are. And it calls us into the reality of who we are. It invites us in. It calls us to have an identity that isn't built around our job, or our sports leagues, or our hobbies, or even our family, as wonderful as that is. But it calls us to an identity that's built around the person and the work of Jesus. But I have a tendency to look away from that mirror and forget who I am. And when I forget who I am, I am very easy to deceive. You know, I'm walking around the streets of New York City not knowing who I am. There's all sorts of other people who want to tell me who I am, and it's not who I truly am. People who want to use me, people who want to deceive me. I have an enemy who desires to deceive me. But when I look in the mirror, I see who I am. What's the alternative to forgetting who I am? What's the opportunity that's being given? Verse 25, and then we'll close. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, the Word of God, the Gospel, and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it. He will be blessed in what he does. The alternative is to remember who I am. And to take time to dig into God's word and to get into community and get other voices in my life who are reminding me who I am. Who are telling me every day, this is who you are. Yeah, you're really messed up and it's ugly. And I've seen what you look like in the morning. But you are loved. You are accepted. You are invited. To be on mission with God. And you need to be reminded of your identity throughout the day. And I need to be reminded of my identity throughout the day. Not in a guilty way. Not in a way that <clears throat> I'm going to get this together. I'm not going to be embarrassed about my life the next time I come to church. But in a way that really wrestles with the soil of our heart. That wrestles with what can I remove from the soil of my heart. That the gospel message might sink in. And that I might be changed. And that I might produce fruit. Not by mechanically trying to produce fruit, but it's the natural result of being a seed planted in good soil. That I would produce fruit. And he says that this is freedom. Not freedom to do whatever I want in rebellion to God, but freedom to be who God made me to be and to experience the joy of that. The Christian life is not a performance. The Christian life is not about guilt. The Christian life is an invitation to be the man or the woman that God made you to be. Living in identity with Him. Living on mission with Him. Enjoying Him. And being a part of a family with other believers that are doing this. That's my hope for you. That's my hope for me. Um, hopefully after the service, if you guys have time, stick around, enjoy a meal, get to know some people, continue to wrestle with these things. Um, but most of all, be a person who goes to the stacks and wrestles. God, what did you call me to do? I don't want to be a listener. I want to be obedient. All right? Let's pray.